Hey, Frank, I have a question for you. Yeah. So when you when you were first doing like podcasting and all that good stuff, what was your like initial thought of what a podcast would would be or do for you? <sighs> oh, I thought, you know, immediate fame and fortune and just okay. adoring fans and love and people come my way. And then all of a sudden people hauled off and didn't listen to it. <laughs> oh, now, now, now. Well, you know what's funny? I think everyone has that, like, in the back of your mind, you just want to hope. Hopefully everyone's going to be there and listen to you. But mm -hmm. you know what I have found over time? That people do listen. They may not be ranting, raving, or commenting, but there's <laughs> so many more lurkers than you realize. You know what I mean? All right. So on that note, well, why don't we want to kick off uh, Afterglow? Are you ready to join our show and then officially be announced here? Well, that's rock and roll. I, right. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm scared because Aaron's not here. Uh, that puts too much pressure on me, but oh, I'll stop it. I think we'll be fine. All right, All right. let's kick this off. I trust you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Afterglow Live Recap Podcast. My name is Sia, and I'm the co-chair for the Dallas Global Leaders Organization chapter. And Erin, I believe, is going to me or may not join us today. So if not, no worries. I think she might be in Fort Worth right now, which is funny considering I'm going to do this announcing the Fort Worth chapter and Mr. Frank Gustafson is going to be the chair kicking it off. Frank, welcome to Afterglow. Hey, hey, see ya. Good to be with you. You know, it's so funny because I've known you on and off the last few years and seeing you looking so presidential right now, I'm like super stoked. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Frank is going to bring like super legitimacy to glow. Look at that. <laughs> That is awesome. That's funny. You don't know how funny that is. <laughs> <laughs> so my apologies. I'm overcoming some sickness, a.k.a. COVID. So my cough, I'm going to try to mute as much as possible. But if I don't, preemptively, everyone, I apologize. I'm not trying to blow out your eardrums. But so, Frank, I am so excited for you to join GLOW. Um, you know, and your excitement and your enthusiasm, I think Fort Worth is going to do some serious ASS kicking. So I have to ask you, why did you join GLOW and then say, screw it, I'm going to be the chair too on top of that. That's a lot of um, responsibility and uh, trust in our organization. Well, you know, so I, I, I've attended a few of your events over in Dallas. I mean, I obviously live on the other side of the world, almost New Mexico from you. And um you know, get over there as much as I can to the events that you guys had up until, uh, you know, a year and a half ago and then kicking off again here uh, last month. And you always, you guys always do such a great job and such great people attend the events. And it's just, um, uh, I always had, a, I was, I always learned something, always had a good time. And I'm like, you know what? We don't have anything like that over in Fort Worth. It, Fort Worth's a little bit of a different community. Um, I think it can thrive from that perspective, and that's my goal here with uh, with Global Leaders Organization to to try to kick something off in Fort Worth that's going to be meaningful for uh, for entrepreneurs. I love it, and I, I appreciate it because um, even though DFW, <coughs> excuse me, DFW area <coughs> people assume you know we, we're twin cities, you know we should be you know same same and. Why don't yeah. you just have a DFW chapter? I don't think people realize how big Texas is and how spread out we are. <coughs> it's yeah. almost like it's almost like people don't realize. Um, I'm a Southern Californian. Look, you can't have a SoCal chapter. You have to have an LA chapter. You have to have an Orange County chapter. And yeah. even then, you know, then you might want to look at maybe something inner city or, or you know, inner empire chapter, right? Yeah it takes about 35, 40 minutes to drive when traffic is not bad. So imagine yeah. if there is traffic, it's a whole, that's a, that is a distance of convenience that for yeah. leaders, business leaders, we just don't have the luxury of time to, you know, let's go to a meeting and drive an hour and a half to get there. And it just doesn't well, make sense. Well, and from my house to your meetings was over an, uh, just a little over an hour and a half from my office to your meetings is probably about 30, 45 minutes um, without traffic. Right. Um, you know, and, and I think that the size is a big thing. And also, 
it's just there is a dichotomy between Dallas and Fort Worth. I know that, I mean, I grew up in Dallas and then I spent 24 years in Minneapolis. Um, and I, while I lived in Minnesota, I, w- I went to Fort Worth more times than the entire time that I lived in Dallas. And it's like people from Dallas tend to not go to Fort Worth and people in Fort Worth tend to not go to Dallas. I'm not, I'm not, you know, drawing a hard line there, but it's just, it's just a dichotomy. It is. And, and culturally it's kind of, it's a different culture in a lot of ways too, uh, between Fort Worth and Dallas. I think the, and when I say culturally, I'm, I'm saying we're all Texans. We're all very proud of that fact. Sure. Sure. Although I'm not, I can't really say that because I'm a Californian, but um, I've been told. Uh, <laughs> but well, over here, we all drive horses different. to work every day. I'm sorry, say that again? We, we all ride our horses to work every day here in Fort Worth. <laughs> uh, I've never seen more cowboy hats than when I'm in Fort Worth. And I was like, this is a Texas that I envision. Like, Fort Worth is more closer to what we envision Texas to be like, right? And it's cool. I love I love the vibe. It's way more laid back. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, just a, it's just a different energy. And that's okay. Like, different, um, you know, when I was talking to our Miami chapter, Mo, um, I mean, come on, Miami is a very different vibe than anywhere else. And of course, our Calgary group and like, you know, even Denver and Vegas. I mean, it's totally different vibes altogether. Right. So, right. Frank, so let me ask you this is like, what do you, what, would you, what you've been part of other business organizations and leadership groups. So what is it that you want to bring to the table that is going to change things up? What's your value that you think you can bring um, and Globe bring to Fort Worth? So a couple of things. Um, I mean, currently I, I own a, a, a Sandler business, Sandler sales training, sales and sales leadership training business. And I think that they're, you know, revenue, I don't know. Revenue is uh, maybe not as important as breathing, but it's right up there pretty close, right? Uh, for for a small business, we got to bring in revenue. And I so I love the, the, um, the sales aspect of what I think I bring to the table. I've owned a couple of small businesses in my past. I've, we started a business in 1993. A friend of mine, he owned it. I was his right-hand guy. And, uh, and we grew that business uh, in the 16 years that I was there from zero to probably just under 500 employees and um, three, four uh, million, uh, hundred million dollars. And then seven years after I left, they went public. So I mean, so I've seen all aspects of business and been involved in all aspects of, aspects of business from tiny all the way up. And, um, and I, so I think I bring a perspective that'll, that will benefit the, uh, the Fort Worth entrepreneur community. And I, and I think I've got some, some skills that I can, that I can bring to that. And, and I'm, I am a lifelong learner. So every single person that I meet, there's something that I can learn from them. So I do appreciate that as well. You know, that's one thing that when I first met you, when Aaron uh, introduced me to you, and I know you guys had a relationship before, um, professional, just want to clarify friends. those terms. Just friends. JJ, if you're watching. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> but there's something about lifelong learning, that curiosity, that mm-hmm. desire to always improve in some capacity and way, I think yeah. is such a core crux of uh, really solid leadership. Um, and when I, and we're talking about something like this, it's um, that willingness to understand that you don't know a lot of things that you don't know, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that you're unconsciously incompetent at things, but then as you learn more about it, educate and have that empathy of knowing that you're at ground zero on something and then having to build and claw your way in to get that knowledge, it's, hum- it's humbling at times, yeah. don't you feel? Yeah, I do. Um, we talk about, uh, uh, with with the folks that I work with, we talk about this acronym called ACASH, and it's about um, and it's about learning. And, and uh, the, the A is for an awareness. You have to be, become aware that there is a gap. Uh, K is, is knowledge. You have to seek knowledge uh, and gain knowledge. And then A is application. So you have to apply that knowledge. And then S is skills. So you build skills on top of the knowledge that you, that you, uh, that you gain. And then finally is habit because eventually it, you get to that uh uh-huh point where it it just comes natural. Whatever this skill that you've learned becomes natural in your, in your life. And it all started with uh, an awareness that there was a gap. Mm. And that's again, knowing that there is that gap though, that's sometimes you can't see the forest from the trees at times, you, you know, at times. So let me ask you this with Sandler training and, um, you know, with your company, 
what is it about Sandler that really attracted to you and applying these principles and, and, and sharing that with your clients? So it's interesting. Um, uh, Mario Martinez put a post out yesterday on LinkedIn and he said, do you think that sales is more uh, art or science? Um, and, and I, and I had to do a little soul searching there. And I used to believe that I used to talk about the art of the deal, the art of sales. And I always believed in my 35, almost all of my 35 years in, in selling that sales was an art. And, and I thought it was probably 99.8% art. And then the rest was just paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> when I, when I, when I, when I found Sandler, um, and I realized that there is some really cool science behind sales. There's some psychology behind sales, and there's some some things that you can that you can learn and adapt to make uh, your life in sales more efficient, more effective, and a little bit easier. Um, that's what I love about it, and it's just it's a it's a great process, and it's a great network of people, and I love my clients. No, I love it too, and I think. The importance of us being, you know, entrepreneurs, business leaders, startups, et cetera, is as your organization grows, you're going to have to have silos in the context of discipline of skill sets, right? Not everyone, you know, granted they say like, if you're an employee of a startup, everyone's in sales, right? Mm -hmm. But, and it's a true statement as far as you are representing to some degree, but as you start growing, you are going to have specialized skill sets, right? And yeah. I've always found it fascinating. And I'm a 20 plus year sales veteran myself. I don't know, should I call it veteran or recovery? I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but but it's, it's. I think it's, there is something about the empathy part of sales, though. I think no one really talks about as much, right? Like the, even the terminology when you think about sales is, oh, I'm a hunter or I'm a farmer. Oh, I love the thrill of the kill. Or it's like, to me, it feels like if I was a client or a customer, you know, customer, collaborator, partner, whatever terminology we ever want to use. Yeah. Um, I would feel like, wait a minute, am I the rabbit here that you are, you're hunting down? And like, you know, like, I don't see, I've never liked using those terms because I've always felt like it put the uh, salesperson on the offensive as some kind of aggressor mm -hmm. and the client uh, on some side of like victim. Yeah, great. Point. Definitely. Do you, do you think that's going to start to shift as, as you see maybe, have you noticed a shift between um, the generations or style of selling? And has Sandler been able to accommodate that or does the foundation lay everything is pretty much the same, even if generations change or viewpoints evolve? Yeah, I think, you know, Sam, the Sandler system is always really focused. Uh, you know, David Sandler said that sales is a Broadway play put on by a psychologist. So there's always been that, that, uh, that, that need to have that emotional intelligence and that empathy and that understanding of who your client is, who your prospect is what they're looking for, what they need, and putting their needs. Uh, um, while, while you maintain control of the process, you put their needs ahead of your needs, and you really focus on what, the, what they've got, um, you know, how you can serve them. So I think that's always been there. Now, as far as changes, yeah. I mean, the last 18 months have kind of flipped sales on its head, and almost everything we've done has been through Zoom or through uh, some other video medium or, or over the phone. Whereas a lot of it used to be face to face, and it is—I think it has forced those those beast hunters that are going out to kill the prey um, to to uh, realize that hey, you know what? I got to I got to chill. I got to I got to look at uh, facial expressions. I got to listen more to tone uh, tone of voice, and and um, I think yeah, I think there have been a lot of changes. Are some of those are some of those necessarily, um, you know, millennial type, age related type, generation type things? Maybe to a degree, but um, I think uh, I think having to take everything to video has really really changed things. So let's let's talk about that because uh, with our guest this past week on Glow, mm -hmm. so Diana, um, she had joined and she was talking about, you know, everyone should publish a book. So how to publish a book and the effectiveness of leveraging um, a book to 
use as a marketing tool. And so like, I'm not going to lie to you. Like I hear this all the time as a podcast producer. Well, there's, you know, 2 million podcasts out there. Like, how am I going to stand out and all that? And my response is always this over 130 million books have been uh, published since the course of our written language that we recognize globally. Mm-hmm. People are still pu- publishing books today. What difference does it make whether you do a podcast or not? Same, same concept, right? Yeah. And I find it so interesting that people have this reticence about podcast production versus you know writing a book. I think both of them are great tools for marketing and um, and also to create brand credibility and to establish yourself, right? So have you thought about writing a book yourself to leverage that as an augment, you know, like an augmented tool to promote yeah. your own business? Yeah. So, so I had a podcast called lead like a Marine and, um, and it was all about, it was really about the, the, the soft skills that, that we learned and, and that were drilled into us in the military um, and how uh, uh, veterans who were coming out of the service were able to use those soft skills in in um, in the workaday world out here in the civilian world. And this this book was about the 14 Marine Corps leadership traits. It was an ebook. It was about 65 pages. Um, uh, I got paid last. Uh, th- I wrote this book in 2016, and I made three dollars and sixty cents last month. Woo-hoo. Well, see, people don't realize those little things. It matters. It, it lives time. on. It, it lives on. Lives, yeah, it lives on, and it supported my podcast. My co- podcast supported the book, so there was a there was a synergy. It supported my coaching business. It really gave all of all of those things came together to uh, to add a little bit of gravitas to what it is that I was trying to get done. You know, I think of it as give me a reason to talk, give me a reason to speak, give me a reason to have people ask me who who are you, what are you doing. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and I don't know if you, um, for those that listen to music of my genre, there's a song that keeps popping up in my head uh, as I was like thinking about today's conversation. It's Portis Head and it's called Give Me a Reason. Now, granted, it's a slightly different context because anyway, but this is the line, give me a reason. And I feel like when you write a book, you're actually sharing your opinion on something that makes you unique. And most people are afraid to share their opinion on something, mm. whether it's their expertise or they just want to like talk about, you know, the color green, whatever have you, doesn't mm-hmm. matter. Yeah. Um, and I just love that component of it. So do you think writing a book is the end all be all? Is it the end all be all? Help me understand. What do you mean the end all be all? Well, I mean, are you, it's like, if, are you going to die if you don't write a book? Are you going to go out of business if you don't write a book? Yeah. I mean, let's, let's be controversial. Let's, let's talk about the benefits of this here. So yeah, let's just say, you know, everyone should write a book because if you want to grow your business and you want to stand out from your competitors, write a book because most of your competitors aren't. Do you agree or disagree with that? Statement? Yeah. Yeah. I think that in, I think that in business, we have to, we have to, we have to look at what our competitors are doing and do something different. Otherwise, we won't stand out. We won't stand apart. And I think writing a book, producing a podcast, a lot of things, um, certainly uh, the answer to your question is, yeah, I think writing a book can be an end-all, be-all. Um, can you be Can you be successful in business without writing a book? Yeah, but, man, write a book. <laughs> well, okay. What if you're not the most literal, literate person? So shoot, the, uh, over the course of the um, uh, conversation with Diana yesterday was get a ghostwriter or get someone to write with you. How comfortable would you be doing that? Like, is that really the best thing you think? Yeah, you know, I think, it, I, and I'm interested in your opinion on that, but I think that everybody's got their own style. They've got their own way. Um, I've got some friends right now that are writing a book. They're using a ghostwriter. And they they fly out to California and and have deep in depth conversations so that this writer understands their their voice understands you know who they are. Um, I think that that can work. Personally, I don't have the patience, the time, and the patience for that. Um, a, a guy that I followed a, a long time ago that that kind of inspired me to write what I wrote. Um, I, I actually blogged each of my chapters as I was writing the book and then I pulled them all together to write the book. 
So that is actually something that um, if Aaron was here, she would mention that, you know, they talk about this funnel, right, of of how you receive data. So mm -hmm. the big thing that grabs a lot of people's attentions is video, right? Because there's a lot of people that are visual and, you know, if they have the time, they can play it in the background. Um, and then there you've got those that like, okay, well, you know what? I, heaven forbid, we don't want people watching YouTube while they're driving, right? Yeah. So then you strip it down to an audio format right. where it's digestible content. And maybe some people just listen better than they see or for whatever reason, if they're multitasking. And then you've got individuals that are like, you know what? No, I need to read it. Um, you know, there are individuals like Joey Wens Wensler here is commenting about books, right? There's something tangible, um, holding a book in your hand. And like, I was joking, but not really, but just smelling the book, you know, just smelling a, mm. the book. And, and what then, book is that you have in front of you? Well, that's funny. Let's hold up at the exact same time. One, two, three, master the star. Yay, Aaron. Yep. Who's the author? Aaron Smith. AKA Gregor. Yes, that's right. Oh yeah, she got married. That's right, huh? Yes, she so, did. So, but this is such a funny thing is that like, and it's unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, Aaron's not well today, but the idea <laughs> that she said, you know what? She's worked with so many entrepreneurs and startups that she came up with a real straightforward guide of like, hey guys, here's how you launch a business. And, and you might have a great idea, but sometimes it's the fundamentals that we lack, right? Whether we went to business school or not, here's some real easier ways to set your life easier to, to to launch your business successfully and make and don't make the same mistakes everyone else has so great book it's an easy read you guys it's not that it's not crazy and you can actually hear aaron's voice while you're reading it which you mm. really <laughs> cracked me up when i was reading it so frank let me see your book real quick because i would like to see what you did on the inside of it because oh. you're a different person than me so 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 i do a lot of audio books i love audio books and a lot of times if I like the audio book, I will actually go buy the physical book and I will listen to it as I read. And I highlight the heck out of stuff like, I mean, Aaron's every, almost every single page has got a highlight. And then um, because I was, I really, I care a lot about Aaron. I like her a ton and I, and I wanted to help support her. So I actually went through and as I highlighted things, I would put a hashtag next to them. And then I would go back in and I would take those hashtags out as as lines and i would tweet them and i would uh, and i would tag her in them just to you know bring publicity to her and to her book and what she was doing at the time when she first launched it now <laughs> maybe maybe three or four people took a look at it and went out and bought her book because of my stuff but hey you know what is what it is but that's all it takes right if ah. you just recommend one more person you've doubled when you go from zero to one hey you doubled right well, if that one goes one to two Double, like, I mean, you know, two to four, you know what I mean? And sure, but, this, but I loved your methodology and your technique on this. And I didn't even think about this is you read the book, you saw a quote that you liked and you put hashtag next to it. I mean, what a, what a great way to, if you're looking at content in general, um, because we're in a social media age now, right? And you don't have to be a quote influencer. You don't have to be on all the social media platforms. Just pick a platform that you want to focus in on because that's where your target audience is. Yeah. <clears throat> and then now you've got content. Maybe you're not promoting master to start today, but maybe there was a, just a situation where her quote is appropriate and applicable. Why not use that? You've got your Insta content right there with an instant hashtag that you can reference. And then you, it's sure. part of the conversation. I like that. I'm going to have to adapt that what you did there because I didn't even think about it. Well, you know, it's and it's interesting, and in, in what Diane talked about on on uh, yesterday on the show um, was how a lot of a lot of businesses who were not well known became well known from publishing a book. I mean, you know, Aaron could be the next Thirty Nine Signals or the next HubSpot or the next Zappos. A lot of those businesses kind of got their got their uh, their traction in the world from the books that they published. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay, again, give me a reason, right? Um, if you want to go down a speaker series, there's a lot of folks that say, hey, I want to take my business and I want to be able to, to be a TEDx speaker, right? I mean, that seems to be like so many people's goals. I want to do TED. I want to do TED. But if you have a book, again, you stated your opinion on something, you've established your credibility, and you've given a reason 
for people to say, you know what? I want that person on my stage. Yeah. Right. Or I want that person on my podcast or I want that person on my video chat. I want that person on my TikTok. Right. Yeah. Whatever it might be. I mean, that's that's really what's compelling. And I think when we think of book publishing, <coughs> I admit it. I, I am, I admit, I thought this way was, oh, that's an old school tactic. You might mm -hmm. as well just do a radio ad too while you're at it, or want you take out an ad in the newspaper, right? The more traditional, you know, ways of marketing and promotion. But you know what? That's not the right attitude to, to think about all these. Every single thing I just mentioned are great tools to promote yourself because it depends on the audience. If I'm talking to people that are in their early 20s, right? The odds are high. I probably would get a better, bigger, bigger, broader impact if I use the platforms that they use, right? So you go to that market. So maybe a traditional newspaper is not the best thing to target to this group. But you know what? It doesn't mean that maybe if my topic is something different, underwater basket weaving and underwater basket weaving community is huge and mm -hmm. loves to hold newspapers, then maybe that's it's appropriate to market in that context. Well, so it, it it's multi-channel marketing, right? It's you've got to have a multi-channel approach to what it is that you're doing, and and if a book is part of it, one of the things that I think that a, a, a book does is it forces you as a as a business person to truly clarify your thoughts and your perspective on something specific, and put it into words, and now you've got a you've got a you've got a published uh, work. That has got your thoughts and your and your mindset in it that you can go back to. Other people can go back to. You can point to. You can take. You can take all of that information and use it in many many different ways. Like you talked about to reach people the way that they want to be reached. Whether it's video, whether it's audio, whether it's written, whether it whether it's you know uh, through social media. However it is, it is right. Right. But you've at least you've at least forced yourself to pull it all together. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> oh, my goodness, this cough. So, Frank, we're getting close up on time, and I want to be able to promote you as much as I possibly can. So talk to me about you a little bit. I want to wrap things up on, you know, who is Frank? And, you know, what's your favorite activity to do when you're not, you know, getting uh, requested to get on Afterglow at the last second? You know, um, I, I just had to I just had to fill out my bio for something this morning and I had to, to write down. So, so, so what I wrote was, look, I got, I've got 35 years of experience in sales, sales leadership, um, senior sales leadership, executive leadership in business, uh, owned a couple of small businesses. So I've done a lot, seen a lot, accomplished a lot, been around a lot, but, but there's, there's three titles that I hold dear that I've held for many years uh, one of them, not as long, um, but they're the most important titles to me. And that's husband. Teresa and I've been married for 32 years. Father. Um, uh, I've got three amazing grown kids and then grand grandfather. We've got two uh, amazing, beautiful granddaughters, three and six. Those are the most important things to me. Um, if all else, if, if I lost everything else and I still had had that, I would be a happy man. Um, but but my passion really, Sia, is to help people take their personal and professional lives, whatever their endeavor is, whatever they're trying to do, to the next level. And and that's what that's what makes my light come on every day. Oh, I love it. Oh my gosh, you are gonna be such an incredible asset in Fort Worth. And I'm look, people, Frank's gonna be managing Fort Worth. Aaron and I are in Dallas, so uh I know he's cool and all, but if you live in Dallas, you're with us guys, okay? Just saying. Don't move to Fort Worth just because you love Frank Moore. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm Ain't nobody just... driving to Fort Worth from Dallas. <laughs> oh, please, please, please. Nobody's hey. crazy like me. Hey, with our podcast studio in Fort Worth, Frank, you, we're definitely going to be hooking up. I feel like the DFW area is going to be such a powerhouse for GLOW. And uh, for those that want to be part of it, we definitely want you to be part of this as well. So, you know, absolutely, guys. Check out uh, Global Leaders Organization. You can go to uh, withglow.com, which is W-I-T-H-G-L-O.com. You can join for free as a basic member, and you can at least see our online platform, kind of get the gist of what we're about. And then, of course, if you'd like to join the local chapter, join as a premium member, and we'll... <coughs> Well, not with my coughing right now, but we will be meeting in person um, again 
COVID safety uh, precautions are going to be under consideration, but we are going to have such a great uh, community, I think, as we kind of come out a little bit more and, again, taking all safety precautions as relevant. Um, on that note, so for Frank, for those that want to get to know you and reach out to you, how can they get a hold of you, sir? LinkedIn is the best place for me. You know, Frank Gustafson on LinkedIn. Um, I, I, I live on LinkedIn. Okay. And then uh, let me go ahead and talk about next week's show. Uh, we have uh, Tissa Richards. She uh, will be discussing the biggest mistakes founders make when raising capital. So this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart because initially when I first started launching, um, when we, Aaron and I first launched our business, I didn't even think about capital. I was like, no, we're bootstrapping this. I'm going to do what, you know, you know, we've got the capabilities of doing it ourselves, but you know what, as our business has grown, as we moved on to three studios, we're realizing very quickly that, Hey, you know what? There's so much more to our business with expansion possibilities. Um, cause I was thinking like a small business owner. I wasn't thinking like a true entrepreneur and glow really helped me broaden my, you know, view of what this business can do and where we can go and take it. So, Sometimes that might require raising access to capital. So I think Tissa Richards is going to have some really interesting insights on, you know, what not to do. Right. So, um, Frank, I want to say thank you so much for your time as always. And um, I'm sure we're going to see you a lot more often because I'm sure we're going to be talking about some really cool joint events that DFW, I'm sure, will do in the future. Amen. Amen. And uh, on that note, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Have a safe Please be safe and uh, we will see you next week. Take care, everyone.